Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or rather good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this opportunity to hear from the London Book Fair author and illustrator of the day, Anthony Brown. My name is Nicolette Jones. I am, among other things, the children's books editor of the Sunday Times. And it's always a pleasure and an inspiration to listen to Anthony. He's one of our finest children's books illustrators and was the sixth of eight children's laureates so far. And during his time in the post, he made a crusade of making as many as possible of us love to look and dare to draw. Born in Yorkshire, he's the son of publicans and was known to stand on a table in the public bar and tell stories. He used to play scrum half, he studied graphic design in Leeds, and he became a medical illustrator and then a designer of greeting cards before his first book, Through the Magic Mirror, was published in 1976. He's since won two Greenaway medals and three Kurt Mashler awards. He's been a writer in residence at Tate Britain. He holds the prestigious Hans Christian Andersen Award, and he's taught us all to play the shape game. His books have sold some five million copies worldwide, and his latest picture book is Frida and Bear, a collaboration with the Danish illustrator Hannah Bartolin. Can I just ask how many of you know Anthony's work? Quick show of hands if you're familiar, so we know whether we're talking to people who already know. Great, a few haven't. Fine, okay, a few okay. haven't. Yeah. Um, you've said, Anthony, that you've been playing the shape game all your life, by yes. which you mean not just that you played it with your brother when you were young. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Tell us about it. Well, I have a drawing that was the earliest drawing on record that I ever made when I was six. And it's a drawing of a pair of legs walking along, and just an ordinary pair of legs walking along. But if you know, if you look at it closely, you notice there's a pirate in the shoe, a little pirate's head, and two pairs of legs cr climbing up my legs. And um, I think that's come from the idea of me just drawing a very boring drawing of a pair of legs walking along, probably my legs, and then thinking it's a bit boring. What's? It's not a very interesting drawing. And so I added the pirate's head. I added the pirate's legs, and suddenly it was transformed from being a boring drawing into something like the beginning of a story or the beginnings of something creative happening rather than just me boringly drawing a pair of legs. And um, the shape game itself is where somebody draws a shape, the other person looks at it, thinks, does that remind me of something? Can I imagine turning that into something? And then they do that. They transform it. So they turn nothing, i.e. an abstract shape, into something. Yes. And I've always thought that that's like every creative thing we do. Every time we write a story or compose a piece of music or draw a picture, we're, we're playing the shape game. We're taking something which exists. In my, in my case, quite often my books come from things that happened to me when I was a boy. Uh, and I tell the story, but I change it. I make it more interesting, more visual, more exciting, maybe. And we also have a, a precedent. We're also borrowing things from other illustrators and other artists Absolutely. and building on those. And one of the things that you've done in some of your books is to take existing paintings yeah. and change things in them or take familiar objects and turn them into something else. Yes. Well, I f when I first started doing books, uh, my early books, have some of them have just got funny things in the background. There's people walking in the park and in the background there's a woman taking a dog for a walk in a pram or a man taking a tomato for a walk. And I just used to put those in to maybe to make the picture more interesting to the reader and maybe to myself as well. But I look back on it now and what I was doing was the pirate's head in the shoe. Yes. They were the equivalent of the pirate's head. It was the beginning of something creative happening. And over a period of time, I started to realize that I could use these funny little details in the background to help to tell parts of the story. So I tried to use yeah, things in the background, the, the setting, the colours, the way people are sitting, the way people are moving, to try to tell parts of the story that the words don't tell us. And that's what really excites me about doing picture books, where the pictures can tell a separate story or another yes. version or a different point of view. And you're interested in the interior life as well as the exterior life. What the, what the images often do, the background often does, is tell you something about the state of mind of the characters. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and going back to using art, famous works of art, mm -hmm. um, I think that's because I, I love art. I'm, I spend a lot of my time looking at paintings, looking at sculptures. Mm -hmm. And so I take whatever, um, whatever is 
in my experience, like paintings, for instance, like references to films, maybe, or, or other books, and try to include them in the story to tell us something else, to tell us how somebody's feeling or what they're thinking about, or maybe a little clue as to what happens next. Since you spent a lot of your life looking at fine art, how do you feel about the status of illustration in, related, in relation to fine art? You, you owe a lot to, say, Magritte, to other... Oops, I'm not allowed to even say that. But <laughs> you once got in trouble, didn't you? I did a, indeed, yeah. Over a, a court case about that. Mm. Um, but there are clearly debts to, to well-known painters in, yeah. in your work. Yeah. Um, but what differentiates you as an illustrator? And should it differentiate the status of what you do um, it's a difficult one, that, because if I start defending illustration against fine art, then it sounds like I'm defending myself against mm -hmm. great painters, and I'm not trying to do that at all. I, I don't see the big difference, I must say. Yes. I think uh, a lot of p um, pictures, p paintings, I should say, are telling a story, whether yes. an obvious story or not. I mean, it's said that every picture paints a story, or, or paints a thousand words or something, mm -hmm. and I think there is something in that. I think a lot of uh, the, the, the word illustrative is used of paintings in a derogatory, derogatory way. Yes. I don't see that. I, I see that a lot of what artists are doing is the same as what illustrators are doing. We, we are suggesting yes. stories. Uh, we are, yeah. And that right from the Renaissance onwards, we're looking at Bible stories or we're looking at yeah. um, uh, myths and legends and so on. There's always, there's a narrative in so many and Victorian pre-Raphaelites. Yeah. Yeah, everything that we think of, there's exactly. often a story going on in it, exactly. right up until abstract art. So it is a strange, um, a strange notion that illust illustration doesn't count. Yes, this is mere illustration is yes. the phrase I hear rather often. Um, it doesn't you, worry me. I, yes. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm very happy as an illustrator. When I first started. When I first left art school, although I studied graphic design, I wanted to be a painter. Yes. That's, that's all I was concentrating on. I'm really thankful now that I did study graphic design mm -hmm. because I think it's that one of the many reasons why I'm doing children's books today. If, I think if I'd have done fine art, I don't think I would have been enjoying myself as much as I am now. Because your, uh, your paintings do have a lot going on in them and a lot to find out, they are quite sophisticated. Do you ever find yourself simplifying things for a ch child audience? I, I try not to. Um, th th sometimes there's a, a, an accusation leveled at art, uh, illustrators or authors indeed who put hide little things mm -hmm. in the books so that the adult reading the story will get it. Yes. And it goes above the, the, the head of the child if the child doesn't know the reference to a particular painter or a particular film or another particular story. Yes. Then we're talking to the wrong audience. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think I avoid that by making sure that if I do have a reference to a painting by Gainsborough, say, in, yes. in, in Piggy Book, it doesn't matter whether we know it's Gainsborough. Yes. Uh, that would be quite an interesting little subject for an adult and a child to share. Oh, yeah, that's a like, like this picture, and then we could, then we could yes. compare and contrast and, and notice the differences. But, but if it works within the context of the story, it's a painting that obviously, in this particular case in Piggy Books, a painting that has a figure missing in the painting, and the figure is of the woman. Yes. And in the story itself, the woman has abandoned the family. Yes. So that in something like Voices in the Park, you might have Marilyn Monroe dancing with the Laughing Cavalier. And if you don't recognize either of those figures, nevertheless, it's a man and a woman dancing and it expresses the joy of the moment. And so that's enough. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. But I like the idea also of there being different layers in a book mm -hmm. so that, that you can go back and every time you see the book, maybe see something new. Yes. And a, a child, I think, can actually accept all sorts of sophistication. I think we have ch uh, conversations with children when we've got a picture book that we would never have otherwise. Yes. As the child is reading the pictures, teaching us in a way how to look ourselves, because I do notice that ch it's children that notice the hidden details. And, yes. and, and they can work out for themselves or with a conversation with an adult exactly what I'm trying to say or exactly what the story is trying to say. You said, I know, in the past that teachers sometimes say you're too old for, story, for pictures and they try and move children on from illustrated books into books that are all text. I've actually noticed that more with parents, actually. Right. It's, it's uh, times when I'm signing books or something, I've, I've heard mm. adults say, oh, no, come on, you don't want to book like that, have a proper book. 
When they say proper book, they mean book without pictures. I think that's a terrible shame. You think, yes, you disapprove. I disapprove of us trying to uh, with people talking about um, pulling children. No, not pulling. What do we talk about? Extending children or something, um, or just get, kind of trying to persuade them to leave books with pictures behind because they're for babies, and to go into the real world, the adult world, the grown-up world, the world of education. That is pictures without uh, books without pictures, and I think that's a real shame. And I think it's one reason why, particularly boys, don't read. But as most men, I, I gather, don't read. Certainly, don't read novels. Um, and I think it's partly that because they're, they're kind of artificially pulled away from something that they enjoy. Um, to 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 uh, to believe that reading is hard and it's something that's difficult to do and it's an ac academic thing to do. Um, I just think it seems so artificial to push and drag our children away from something that they're reading, which isn't, to, which, which isn't to say that I think that picture books are better than novels. Of course not. Mm -hmm. I think it's great if we, can, if we can read both. But you also believe that it's very important that we do learn to look. Yes. And that we, um, that in fact, if we are practiced at looking at the details of pictures, it is a training in everything from not just art, but science. Absolutely. And, and uh, every other discipline is about observation, really. The world is about observation. Yes. And, uh, and children can be encouraged, pushed, pushed away from uh, noticing the world. Very much so. We're taught to think of um, images as being uh, something kind of superficial. We don't, yeah. can't judge, we mustn't judge a book by its co cover. But I think we miss so much. I think if you go into a, uh, an art museum, it's, uh, I think it's been statistically shown that people spend on average 30 seconds looking at a, a, a work of art mm -hmm. and up to three minutes looking at the caption. Which are explaining it, and I think that uh, that's a shame that's, uh, because we, yeah, we don't. But although we we brought up in a world, in a very visual world, particularly now with films and DVDs and computer games and everything, it's but it's it, they these are moving images. We yes. don't really take. We're not really encouraged to sit and look at one image and and to think about it and to react to it and to feel about it. Yes. I think it's something we. Uh, me included. I, 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 I sometimes have to force myself to spend longer time looking at a work of art, something that I might dismiss, thinking, oh, that's not very interesting. Mm -hmm. If I stand there for long enough, if the picture's good enough, then I'll find things in that I wouldn't have seen on a, on a superficial that's interesting. glance. We, we think we're, we live in a visual society, but as you say, the images are fast. Yeah. And picture books are about looking at things slowly. Mm. Um, I want to ask you a slightly different question. Um, you are known for... Uh, drawing monkeys. Talk yeah. to us about monkeys. Where do they come from? Monkeys. Well, I'd like to, to be pedantic and say it's apes rather than monkeys. Apes, it is indeed. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't used to know. I used to get asked that question and I, I didn't know. Well, I, maybe I just like them. I just like gorillas particularly or chimpanzees. Um, but I think I've come to realize that it's something to do with uh, how close they are to us. Uh, in fact, a little boy once answered this question for me years and years ago. He said, why do you draw gorillas and monkeys so, so much? And I said, well, why do you think? And he thought about it and he said, um, well, he thinks it's a bit like my, some of my pictures. If you look at them, they look normal. So it might be, I don't know, a, a family sitting on a sofa yes. or something. He says, when you look more closely, you can see that it's not quite. There's something mm. odd, something peculiar going on. So it might be the man who's got a, instead of a flower in his buttonhole, he's got a, a pig's head or something, or yes. a flower which looks like the head of a pig. Yes. And he said that's a bit, yeah, it's a bit like a gorilla. They they they're very much like us. They're very much yes. like humans, but not quite. And I think that's got a lot to do. That kind of ambiguous feeling about looking into a gorilla's eyes, in 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 a, in a zoo and and feeling almost that there's a human being inside that gorilla looking back. So I, we can almost imagine the feelings that that gorilla's got, the sensitivity. And the other thing is my father, I've, that I've talked about my father before, who was a big man, much bigger than me, a physical man. He'd been a soldier and he fought in the Second World War and he was a boxer and he played rugby and football and cricket and taught my brother and I to do all these kind of macho sports. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would also sit with us and draw pictures and write poems with us. And so the, he had this great contrast. He was a man who looked kind of fierce. He, he looked a bit like a, an ex-soldier. 
but he was actually very gentle and sensitive and uh, I couldn't imagine him doing the things that I later read in his diary that he'd had to do during the Second World War, things I couldn't have imagined him doing. So in a way, gorillas are rather like that. They're obviously big and incredibly strong and powerful and look very fierce, but yeah. most of the time in the, in the, in the wild, they're gentle, the, the males help to bring up the babies. So I think that's got a lot to do with it as well. And one of the other things that people identify about your work is that you have an interest in class and that you have more of a working class perspective, or at least you're sympathetic to your working class characters mm. in a way that not very many illustrators are. We're all middle class. We're all middle uh, class, yes, exactly. Um, I think it's more a sympathy for the underdog. I think I've always, yes. um, as far as long as I can remember, I don't know, it sounds pathetic, but sort of felt sorry for people. Felt sorry yes. for people who say were no good at sport, for instance, yes. or were no good at maths or academic st st stuff. As well. but I think it's just a continuation of that, really. So I think, of course, in most stories that we ever read, fairy tales or whatever, it's usually about the underdog triumphing in the sense. Maybe it's wishful thinking on my part. Maybe, <laughs> I, maybe I associate with the underdog. I don't know, but but I think it's, of course, I'm aware of class as, as well, and my politics would probably suggest that that's part of my makeup as well. Yes. Uh, your books sell throughout the world. Um, are there certain things that you think work better in other countries than they do here, or are there things that work in Britain that don't work abroad? It's interesting. Um, I, I certainly am... Uh, luckily very popular in certain parts of the world. It sometimes feels though as though it's more there than it is here. Um, but which I'm, which I'm countries not, in particular? Um, Latin America particularly um, and, and Korea are the two, mm -hmm. two big markets for me at the moment. Both uh, areas that haven't traditionally had a history of picture books I suppose. So they've come to picture books later than we have here, the, the long mm -hmm. history of picture books we've got. Mm -hmm. So it may have something to do with that and I think I was lucky in that a lot of my best books were published quite close to each other in a relatively short period of time, therefore making a maybe more of an impact than the long, slow process it's been dragging myself up as, a, as, a, as an illustrator in this country, maybe. And are there certain things that you think don't, don't travel? Do you have to change anything in your picture books? I've had books to become more aware of, yes, some dangers. I've had a, a, I went through a real period, not so much with uh, books abroad, although there was one book I did... Um, um, a pop-up where I included a, a certain flag in, in one of the pictures which proved a problem where the book was being published and because it was a pop-up book also being manufactured there. And that caused a big problem and the book had to be pulped and, and made again. So there are some dangers. But I have just as many dangers here with the Magritte. I was sued by the Magritte estate. I was working on a book about the Beatles until one of them uh, made an objection and I wasn't allowed to do it. So I've had, I've really read, a, I went through a bad patch of uh, uh, infringing copyright particularly. So I'm more careful in that respect. Any, any paintings I make references to now in my books are from artists who died at least 75 years ago. I see. So when you were Tate artist in residence, you were having to concentrate on the older paintings. I was taking it? Victorian narrative paintings as my theme. Yeah. As, as your main influence, that's very interesting. But I don't want to draw too much attention because there were one or two paintings in there that possibly yes. might have been on the edge of copyright problems. Um, I want to give people a chance to ask questions, but one last one while they're thinking about it. Um, how do you think uh, children's illustration has changed in the time that you have been working? Obviously, there's more. There are technological changes. We see the influence of computers more in yep. the in the illustrations, less hand-drawn work. Um, are there differences in the market? Differences in the way things are sold? The expectations for you as a performer? What, like what's changed? Oh, okay. yes. um, <laughs> in a nutshell. In a nutshell, I think I think children's books are going through a very good period. I think generally, yeah. despite many problems. I think mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I think the computer. It's not, computers are not for me in terms of making illustrations, but there's a lot of young illustrators using computers. Mm -hmm. But most of them, it seems, are drawing as well. They're not just using the computers. Yeah. They're drawing and then scanning it yes. and playing around with the color. I mean, there's mm -hmm. lots of creative things going on there. So I don't think we're in danger of losing good picture books in any way. Yes, and draftsmanship, not yes, in danger? I think that's probably more to do with art colleges than, than mm -hmm. illustrators. I think the drawing is a kind of forgotten art at art college. The, yeah. I sound like a grumpy old man and I don't want to. Um, but I do think that drawing is, in my experience, a fairly limited experience now, um, 
it undervalued at, at, at college. And we, uh, we'd, we'd been going through a period where, yes, um, ideas and being able to talk about the artwork or write about the artwork or not actually make the artwork has been a, a kind of a fashionable thing to do. Mm. I think we go. I think there's quite a lot of signs that there are painters actually making more naturalistic paintings, uh, which is not necessarily a better thing than an abstract painting or indeed a video mm. installation. Um, but I think it maybe it's harder if if, if nobody at the, at the at art college are able to encourage you or teach you to draw. Then I think that's a bit of a problem. Yes. I also think that the publishing industry, certainly in Britain. It's got a lot of pressures on it, pressures to sell, pressures to have success with somebody's first book rather than when I first started. My, my editor, Judy McRae, who used to be in those days, and she still is, but she's not my editor anymore, uh, would say I, I, she takes authors and illustrators on not for their first book, but yes. for their third book. And in those days, you were allowed to do that in publishing. Now it's more difficult. I know success has to come fairly quickly. So, are there any questions from the audience? Opportunity? Yes, this lady at the front. There's a mic, I believe, if we can get it to you very quickly. This is being filmed, so they want to wait for the mic to get to you so that you can be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, illustrated books for adults, right. of which there are many. And yes, I was really are. pleased to hear your thoughts about illustration and how important it is. Yeah. I can only think of Alistair Gray as a, a great writer yes, and illustrator. Indeed, of his indeed, own books. that's a very good connection. Very good connection. Yes, um, and of course, graphic novels, of course, which I actually, and I've talked to one or two illustrators of picture books, find quite difficult to read. I don't know why. I, 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 um, graphic novels should be right up my street. I love pictures, I love words, I love the combination. For some reason, I have a bit of a blind spot. I find them difficult. But I'm glad that they exist, very glad that they exist. And I think they're. I think that's why uh, I think a lot of men, for instance, read graphic novels. Maybe because they were the men who were dragged away kicking and screaming from illustrated books maybe too early because they, they, their parents thought they should be just looking at proper books. Um, but I think, yes, the idea of illustrating adult books is a fantastic one. Of course, in Alistair Gray's case, it's great help that he writes and illustrates. Uh, maybe I could, maybe. Maybe There's maybe. a thought. Yeah, thank you. Yes, <laughs> Watch this space. <laughs> yes. Uh, lady over there, if we can get to you. It's interesting, actually, that graphic novels, I think, are, are increasingly filmic. Yeah. So you have to be quite au fait with film techniques yes. in order to be able to read them like a film. But then they sometimes seem like a storyboard for a film. That's uh, true. As though they're okay. one thing almost pretending to be another. But I, but I don't want to criticise graphic novels, though. No. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes, Lady over there. Have you found that um, th any change in tastes of what children like to read over the years? Um, that's a, a di I, I, was I was going to say that's a good question. But what I mean when I say that's a good question is, is I'm, I, I usually mean I'm not quite sure what the answer is. <laughs> um, I, it's difficult for me to say. I am, one imagines... Children's taste has, has changed a lot through animated cartoons, which a lot of them see on the television, or indeed uh, computer games. It, so I suppose it must have done. I haven't noticed because, well, I've recent, relatively recently stopped doing school visits, and when I do go into schools, I talk about my, my work and my pictures. And I must say, I haven't noticed a different reaction to those. But... I'm not in a position really to be able to stand outside and say, yes, children's tastes in, 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 in illustrated books has changed. I'm, I'm sure it must have done, but I don't actually think children have changed. I think ultimately um, we're uh, all over the world, children are, are all, all the same and yet individually different. And I think that's true of humans as well. I mean, adult, adults, I mean, sorry. <laughs> A Freudian slip. <laughs> I'm not sure if, uh, if, if taste changes all that much, because I think it's a question of what you introduce children to at, right at the beginning. So I think children like the picture books they first encounter, possibly, although, as you say, there are all these other influences. Um, so do you, as long as do you, you like them. But, but children's tastes have changed. No? no. Um, Mike? I, I guess not... Maybe not the taste, but the way they, the way they read or consume it has changed. So it's probably not always books now, but maybe more on iPad. So I think that has changed. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's more interactive. Yeah. So you know, so they they keep they're more engaged. 
um, so it speaks Dif- to them. Differently yeah, engaged, yeah. I'd yeah, like differently to think. Yeah, differently engaged. Yeah, yeah. Then picture books have always been interactive. That's yeah. the joy yeah. of them. Yeah. But uh, yeah. uh, any other questions? Um, is that a, yes? Yep. Gentleman over there. Hi. Um, there is actually a huge debate uh, about gender and the way uh, some books are designed for, especially for girls, uh, pink and princess, or for boys, blue and cars. Uh, do you think that uh, publisher may, must be careful with this uh, kind of stereotypes? Yes. Yes, I think. Um, of course, I. I don't think I've ever done a pink book or a blue book yet, and I don't think I ever will. Um, yes, it is a danger, I think. Uh, presumably brought about by the by the economy, by the market. Um, it's something I'm aware of, and sometimes I look back on one or two of my books and I'm maybe a little uncomfortable about. I'm trying to think which ones. My mum, for instance, I did My Dad and My Mum, and I did My Dad first, and it was based on my own father. And I found it very easy to make fun of him or fun of dads in general. <laughs> For some reason, I apologize to say this, but I found it more difficult with my mum. Uh, as though it was more dangerous territory for me to make fun of. Well, of course, your father died when you were quite young. Yes. And your mother presumably was, was she still she around? She was alive when I did my mum, yes. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. It, I think it was more about... I was more self-aware uh, of what mm-hmm. I was doing and how how my mum would be interpreted. I'm still not completely sure I got it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, my uh, dear, dear French editor, when she saw my mum, she said she liked it, but she th- thought that the the mother should be more sexy. Oh, quite oh. difficult for you to draw then. Very, well, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. And the other related question to the gentleman's question over there is about a consciousness of diversity in the books. Yeah. I mean, when you're drawing gorillas, yeah. it's anybody. Um, but is that something that you also think about, about the different kinds of children that you're depicting? Yes, I've, I've, I think that's maybe, although I'm not conscious why... I use animals in my books quite a lot, mm-hmm. but I suppose it's not a, it's not so much a diversity as yes, I suppose it is diverse. I mean, I, as I said before, I think we are all all different but all the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't particularly want to do books about little uh, middle class white English boys. Um, so I think maybe that's why I'm doing chimpanzees or or bears or. But also, I mean, a, a book called The Tunnel, for instance, this is about a boy and a girl, brother and a sister, and this is, I was ov- obviously aware of the dangers of gender typecasting because the little girl reads fairy stories and, and is always seen in front of a, of a flowery wallpaper. The boy goes outside playing football and is seen in front of a, of, a, of a brick wall. So in a sense, the flowery wallpaper represents the girl and the brick wall represents the boy. The boy goes down this dangerous tunnel without thinking, and then the girl rescues him. And right at the end of the book, we have the end papers are the wallpaper again, and we, by this time we're reading that this is the girl's wallpaper and this is the boy's wallpaper. Uh, not wallpaper, no, this is the, the image which represents the boy. But when we look closely, we can see that this is actually wallpaper. You can see the lines of where the rolls have been joined together. So I was trying there to say something about... It was about my childhood. I grew up with my brother, and we did know a very dangerous tunnel, a scary, really scary tunnel. And I was retelling the story, but I split it into a boy, a boy and a girl. So in a way, it seems as the story is about brothers and sisters. But I didn't think of it as that. I thought of it as the two different aspects of our individual characters. But yes, we played football, and yes, we drew pictures and and and. and uh, and do, read you, do you not worry about the floweriness being the girl? Isn't that not a bit stereotypical? It, it's, meant it's meant to be. It's meant to be. It's meant to be. This is how... And the, and the girl, the boy seems to be the brave one because he right. goes down the tunnel with bravado and th- yes. uh, not thinking, just thinking it was exciting. Yes. She waited for him and worried and worried because he didn't come out. So she really plucked up her courage, crawled down the, tu- uh, down the tunnel and rescued him. He'd yes. been turned to stone. And she rescued him. So, so yes, it's a stereotype in a sense that uh, piggy book is a stereotype too. Yes. But I, I'd like to think I was playing with those yes. stereotypes and trying to encourage us to look at them in a different way. Excellent. Um, I'm s- sad to say we've sort of run out, but maybe we could squeeze in one very quick question if there is one. 
otherwise, no. Thank you very much for, mm. for listening for your, and for your questions. And uh, just to tell you that Anthony will be signing copies of his book right here in the Foils bookshop afterwards. Huge thank you to Anthony. Wonderful to hear thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.